This is TED Health. I'm Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Today, an exciting vision of how technology can make us more human. Writer Rebecca Nill talks about the ways people respond to her deafness. Outdated, stereotyped, and just plain incorrect. And she shows how cochlear implants have given her a kind of agency over her hearing loss. And after, I'll talk to my friend, Dr. B.J. Miller, a former TED speaker and palliative care physician whose own physical disability has helped him to think in new ways about how he interacts with patients. My name is Rebecca, and I'm a cyborg. (laughs) Specifically, I have 32 computer chips inside my head, which rebuild my sense of hearing. This is called a cochlear implant. You remember the the Borg from Star Trek? Those aliens who conquered and absorbed everything in sight? Well, that's me. (laughs) The good news is I come for your technology and not for your human life forms. (laughs) Actually, I've never seen an episode of Star Trek. But there's a reason for that. Television was in closed captioned when I was a kid. I grew up profoundly deaf. I went to regular schools, and I had to lip read. I didn't meet another deaf person until I was 20. Electronics were mostly audio back then. My alarm clock was my sister Barbara, who would set her alarm and then throw something at me to wake up. (laughs) My hearing aids were industrial strength, sledgehammer, volume, but they helped me more than they helped most people. With them, I could hear music and the sound of my own voice. I've always liked the idea that technology can help make the world more human. I used to watch the stereo flash color when the music shifted, and I knew it was just a matter of time before my watch could show me sound, too. Did you know that hearing occurs in the brain? In your ear is a small organ called the cochlea. And the cochlea is lined with thousands of receptors called hair cells. When sound enters your ear, those hair cells, they send electric signals to your brain, and your brain then interprets that as sound. Hair cell damage is really common. Noise exposure, ordinary aging, illness. My hair cells were damaged before I was even born. My mother was exposed to German measles when she was pregnant with me. About 5% of the world has significant hearing loss. By 2050, that's expected to double to one in 10. For seniors, it's already one out of three. With a cochlear implant, computer chips do the job for the damaged hair cells. Imagine a box of 16 crayons. And those 16 crayons, in combination, have to make all of the colors in the universe. Same with the cochlear implant. I have 16 electrodes in each of my cochleas. Those 16 electrodes, in combination, send signals to my brain representing all of the sounds in the universe. I have electronics inside and outside of my head to make that happen, including small processor, magnets inside my skull, and a rechargeable power source. Radio waves transmit sound through the magnets. The number one question that I get about the cochlear implant when people hear about the magnets is whether my head sticks to the refrigerator. (laughs) No, it does not. Thank you, thank you. I know this because I tried. (laughs) Hearing people assume that the deaf live in in a perpetual state of wanting to hear because they can't imagine any other way. But I've never once wished to be hearing. I just wanted to be part of a community like me. I wanted everyone else to be deaf. I think that sense of belonging is what ultimately connects our stories, and mine felt incomplete. When cochlear implants first got going back in the 80s, the operation was 
Frankenstein monster scary. By 2001, the procedure had evolved considerably, but it still wiped out any natural hearing that you had. The success rate then for speech comprehension was low, maybe 50 percent. So if it didn't work, you couldn't go back. At that time, implants were also controversial in the deaf culture. Basically, it was considered the equivalent of changing the color of your skin. I held off for a while, but my hearing was going downhill fast, and hearing aids were no longer helping. So in 2003, I made the tough decision to have the cochlear implant. I just needed to stop that soul-sucking cycle of loss, regardless of whether the operation worked. And I really didn't think that it would. I saw it as one last box to check off before I made the transition to being completely deaf, which a part of me wanted. Complete silence is very addictive. Maybe you've spent time in a sensory deprivation tank, and you know what I mean. Silence has mind-expanding capabilities. In silence, I see sound. When I watch a music video without sound, I can hear music. In the absence of sound, my brain fills in the gaps based on the movement I see. My mind is no longer competing with the distraction of sound. It's freed up to think more creatively. There are advantages to having bionic body parts as well. Um, it's undeniably convenient to be able to hear, and I can turn it off any time I want. <laughs> I'm hearing when I need to be, and the rest of the time I'm not. Bionic hearing doesn't age, although external parts sometimes need replacement. It would be so cool to just automatically regenerate a damaged part, like a real cyborg, but I get mine FedExed from Advanced Bionics. <laughs> Oh, I get updates downloaded into my head. It's not quite airdrop, but close. <laughs> with the cochlear implant, I can stream music from my iPod into my head without earbuds. Recently, I went to a friend's long, tedious concert. <laughs> And unknown to anyone else, I listened to the Beatles for three hours instead. <laughs> Technology has come so far so fast. The biggest obstacle I face as a deaf person is no longer a physical barrier. It's the, the way that people respond to my deafness, the outdated way people respond to my deafness. Pity, patronization, even anger, because that just cancels out the human connection that technology achieves. I once had a travel roommate who had a complete temper tantrum because I didn't hear her knocking on the door when her key didn't work. If I hadn't been there, no problem. She could get another key. But when she saw that I was there, her anger boiled over. She, it was no longer about a key. It was about deafness not being a good enough reason for her inconvenience. Or the commercial about the deaf man whose neighborhood surprised him with sign language messages from people on the street. Everyone who sent me the video told me they cried. So I asked them, well, what if he wasn't deaf? What if his first language was Spanish and everyone learned Spanish instead? Would you have cried? And they all said no. They weren't crying because of the communication barrier. They were crying because the man was deaf. But I see it differently. What if the Borg showed up in that video and the Borg said, deafness is irrelevant, because that's what they say, right? Everything's irrelevant. And then the Borg assimilated the deaf guy, not out of pity, not out of anger, but because... He had a biological distinctiveness that the Borg wanted, including unique language capabilities. I would much rather see that commercial. Why does thinking about ability make people so uncomfortable? 
You might know a play, later a movie, called Children of a Lesser God by Mark Medoff. That play, that title, actually comes from a poem by Alfred Tennyson. And I interpret the, both the play and title to say that humans who are perceived as defective were made by a lesser God and live an inferior existence, while those made by the real God are a superior class because God doesn't make mistakes. In World War II, an estimated 275,000 people with disabilities were murdered in special death camps because they didn't fit Hitler's vision of a superior race. Hitler said that he was inspired by the United States, which had enacted involuntary sterilization laws for the unfit in the early 1900s. That practice continued in more than 30 states until the 70s, with the last law finally repealed in 2003. So the world is not that far removed from Tennyson's poem. That tendency to make assumptions about people based on ability comes out in sentences like, you're so special, I couldn't live like that, or thank God that's not me. Changing how people think is like getting them to break a habit. Before the implant, I had stopped using the voice telephone and switched to email. But people kept leaving me voicemail. They were upset that I wasn't reachable by phone and not returning messages. I continued to tell them my situation. It took them months to adapt. Fast forward 10 years, and you know who else hated voicemail? Millennials. (laughs) Millennials. <laughs> and you know what they did? They normalized texting for communication instead. Now, when it comes to ignoring voicemail, it no longer matters whether you're deaf or just self absorbed. <laughs> Millennials changed how people think about messaging. They reset the default. Can I just tell you how much I love texting? Oh, and group texts. My, I have six siblings. They're all hearing, but, but I don't think any less of them. <laughs> and we all text. Do you know how thrilling it is to have a visual means of communication that everyone else actually uses? So I am on a mission now. As a consumer of technology, I want visual options whenever there's audio. It doesn't matter whether I'm deaf or don't want to wake the baby. Both are equally valid. Smart designers include multiple ways to access technology, but segregating that access under accessibility, that's just hiding it from mainstream users. In order to change how people think, we need to be more than accessible. We need to be connected. Apple did this recently. On my iPhone, it automatically displays a visual transcript of my voicemail right next to the audio button. I couldn't turn it off even if I wanted to. You know what else? Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime no longer say closed caption for the hearing impaired. They say subtitles, on or off, with a list of languages underneath, including English. Technology has come so far. Our mindset just needs to catch up. Resistance is futile. (laughs) You have been assimilated. Thank you. Welcome back, listeners. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to my dear friend, Dr. B.J. Miller. B.J. is a palliative care physician, the co-founder of Metal Health, and a former TED speaker. B.J., it's so great to talk with you. Thank you, Shoshana. It's very nice to be with you. B.J., you live with a visible disability. Can you tell us your story? Yeah. And by the way, I love the way you phrased that, Shoshana. That's sort of good disability etiquette. Start with the person first, person with a disability. 
disability happens to be one detail of many. Thank you for putting it that way. And right, and it's different living with a visible disability. That is true too. I couldn't hide my disability if I wanted to. <laughs> and I used to want to. But anyway, to answer your question, coming up on 32 years, I was a sophomore in college, November of 1990. And uh, friends of mine and I were just kind of horsing around one night and we decided to climb a parked commuter train, like you would climb a tree or something. When I stood up on top of the train, I got close enough to the power source and the electricity arced to my metal watch on my left arm. And that was a big explosion and lots of burns and close to death for a while and ended up losing both legs below the knees and one arm below the elbow. And that began my life as a person with a disability. And do you feel like your experience of losing limbs informed your decision to go into palliative care as a specialty? Oh, totally. Medicine in general, it wasn't on the top 10 list to be a doctor until I was a patient. That sort of tuned me in to the medical system, both what it could do, it absolutely saved my life, and what it could do better. And I'd grown up around disability. My mother has post polio syndrome. And my childhood had been something of a caregiver. I had been used to these issues living with an obvious difference, a physical one. And how do you navigate a world that's not really built for you? And how do you interface with the healthcare system sworn to help you, but often marginalizes you, condescends to you, doesn't know how to talk to you, so it doesn't talk to you, all sorts of things. How do we navigate the experience of illness, the experience of healthcare? Each of us might handle living with these issues very differently. This is a very subjective endeavor in palliative care where we embrace this subjective thing. It's where the interest is. It's where the action is. What do humans do when they bump up against things they can't change, that they can't fix? Our healthcare system loves to fix people. It really struggles when it can't. So if you're one of those people who's no longer fixable, you may feel abandoned by healthcare. It's not uncommon. And it's that space that palliative care is dipping into. That's where so much of the interest is. It was with these experiences that got me interested in medicine and specifically palliative care. And building on what you said, how has your disability informed the way that you care for your patients or maybe the ways that they relate to you? Both. I mean, one is, thanks to this being an obvious disability, very often with my patients, we don't necessarily talk about my disability or my accident. It's just sort of taken as a given. You just look at me, the silhouette of me, and you can draw some conclusions and that sets a vibe. And you know that I've been in the bed. I've had pain. I've been a patient. You know, I've gone through some tough stuff. I've got a body that I probably wish were otherwise sometimes. And even if that stuff never gets spoken between a patient or a family and me, it's kind of in the room. So for the most part, I feel like the obvious nature of my disability lends credence to what I'm saying and actually helps further the trust that I'm trying to cultivate with patients and their families. So my disability has helped my practice by virtue of helping this trust. And from that trust is where so much good stuff happens. So that's one point. That's just sort of symbolic. But more specifically, like there's also some things that you learn by being a patient. You know, what it's like to actually sit around and wait for test results when a doctor second guesses your pain. What it's like to feel not heard, to complain about something for which there's not a solution and watch yourself get gaslit. These kinds of experiences, which are so much the marker of being a patient, I know what that feels like. And so I can not only empathize with my patients, but I can also guide them about all sorts of nuances that come from being in these shoes about how to not take things so personally. Or when you bump up against this energy, coach folks into how to communicate with the doctor. BJ, there's a growing percentage of people living with some form of disability, partly due to advances in technology and in medicine. We're really able to help people live who otherwise might have died. But with more and more people able to live with chronic illness or disability mm -hmm. into old age, mm -hmm. what are the ways that our medical system is really challenged to care for people? Mm. Well, you're right. I am one of those people who is alive thanks to medical technology. And I'm very grateful for that. 
but the medical model that sees you as a bundle of physiological processes doesn't necessarily understand what it feels like to live with these situations, doesn't know the kind of social support someone might need. All the things that get left out of the medical encounter, spiritual, existential, social, relational, that's where so much of the action is. So to your point, the healthcare system and its technology can maintain a pulse. But once you're discharged from the hospital, it's kind of on you to figure out how to place yourself in society, how to find work, how to live at all, period. And you can see if you have a myopic medical system that sees its role as strictly medical, strictly physiologic, and the rest is not my department, okay, that's fine as long as we have a social system that is taking up that challenge. Right now, medicine is sort of the arbiter of all things health and well-being. Our ERs are filled with people who are there for circumstantial reasons, for whom there are no social systems waiting to help care for them. So you can say, not my department, but you're going to see these folks again and again on your little Ferris wheel of medical care. So medicine has to help cultivate other systems to take up the slack, or medicine has to see itself as involved with people beyond just their basic physiology. That's a question for healthcare and a question for society. But we better answer that quickly because to your point, we're helping zillions of people survive things that otherwise would have ended their lives. But society has not yet found a place for these folks like myself to belong. That's a big problem. And I've talked to many patients for whom the good news of survival ceases to feel like good news. And that's sad. Thank you for saying that. We're failing in so many ways. We're falling short. It's so important that we talk about that. Right on. You've said that you make it a point to wear shorts when you're out in public to try to normalize your experience. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel like this is important? I remember I used to want to hide. I used to hide my scars. But somewhere along the way, hiding, trying to pass became really anti-therapeutic. It was getting in my way of being real before my own life. This is my life and I don't want to partition it. I don't want to squint. I don't want to forget about parts of myself just to hang in there. And so for my own personal development, my own therapy, I eventually had to come to terms with this was it. This was my body. This was my life. So be it. And if not live out loud, at least not go to trouble hiding it either. That was a gradual process, took a few years. It's also a question of what did I owe people? What did I owe society? Did I have any responsibility to live out loud, to live my example in a more public way? Well, no, I don't think I have a responsibility to do that. Although I had my own guilt around a lot of debts of gratitude that I definitely wanted to find a way to repay those debts. And that's a slightly different conversation. But one way or another, I came around to this idea that for my own sake, as well as the world I'm trying to help cultivate, it makes a lot of sense to live out loud a little bit, to wear shorts, to not hide. There's a difference between drawing attention to myself and not going to great lengths to hide from that attention. I'm happy. I'm at peace with this. I think we all have to be the example that you want to help cultivate the world, live your life like the way that you think it should be lived. And perhaps people will take note. Perhaps people will do likewise. And I just want to love my reality. I want to love my life. That's all I'm trying to do here. And I think if we all did that, boy, it'd be a better world. I certainly agree. Can you share an experience that you've had in a healthcare setting that went particularly well, maybe where the clinician approached you and your disability with humility and genuine curiosity? It's not like we have to have perfect sensitivity and the perfect language to accommodate everybody in just such a way. I don't think that's possible. We'd rather have the basic humility to know what we don't know and sort of ask, like, would it be all right if I addressed you in this way? Or I've never had a patient who's a trilateral amputee. Do you mind if I ask you some basic questions that may feel very basic for you, but that are new to me. Just that simple human humility and curiosity and deference, you know, respect, basically. It's that simple. It's what any of us would want, no matter how many limbs we have. And there are many examples that have people have made assumptions and said ridiculous things. And were not self-aware and were not humble and pretended they understood things that they didn't. And that's annoying. 
So I've had positive and negative examples. The lesson here is don't feel like you got to go master a new vocabulary to talk with people who have disabilities. Just remember what it's like to be a human being. Try not to gaslight. Try not to ignore or deny someone's experience. You know, the fundamentals. Treat others like human beings. I love it. Yeah. Novel. (laughs) BJ, has technology given you agency over your disability that maybe didn't exist decades ago? I know that's a little bit of a leading question. Technology, yes. I'm technology dependent to a point, but in the obvious ways. My mobility depends on prosthetic feet, which have been around for eons. There have been advances in material sciences so that my prosthetic feet are not what you would have seen 30 years ago. Wars are very useful for us amputees. That's where technology usually takes a leap. But it's not exotic stuff. What's one thing that you wish we did differently as a society with respect to honoring people's differing abilities? Well, like we said, a little bit of just basic respect, deference, some intersubjectivity, being interested in someone's experience, not trying to superimpose yours upon another. All those things. I guess I'm longing for greater self-awareness. As a disabled person, as someone who's navigated these things for some time and made his peace, you know, a lot of people come at you with pity, these sort of proxies for empathy. Yeah, pity is chief among them. That's a real negative zone for those of us who live with disability. We don't want to be pitied. Now, when people approach me with this poorly formed attitude that I'm somehow less than, and therefore they are somehow more than, one of the things that those of us with disabilities kind of laugh at is, I know you're looking at me right now like I'm the one who's fragile and frail. And if only I could have all your limbs and all your resources, I'd be so much happier. That's sort of the presupposition of a lot of the pity. Whereas with those of us in these shoes are sitting there saying, you kidding me? You think you're invulnerable? You've been so lucky to make it this far with your limbs and no major illnesses. And you don't think something like this is coming for you? Oh, buddy, joke's on you. So what any of us in similar shoes would long for is essentially people to be a little bit more aware of just how vulnerable they are. And related to this is the corollary in the medical world of like, who's the reference point? Who gets to be the standard normal person against whom we're all compared and contrasted, whether it's our BMI or height or whatever it is? Who are these mythical normal people to which we compare and contrast ourselves? That is such a flawed setup. If your body, your life looks like this thing that's supposed to be normal, well, don't bank on it staying there. And more to the point is, We're way more interesting, way more diverse than that. So if we're using like a medical model or a a normal, healthy person, let's not confuse our oversimplified, reduced models for the realities those models are trying to help us digest. That's a mistake that happens all the time, and it drives me bonkers. You need to be aware of when you're conflating your model with the reality that's trying to help you digest. Disability is an interesting minority group because any of us can join at any time. That also gets at why it's terrifying to people. For those of you guys out there who are afraid of becoming disabled at some point, well, it ain't so bad. And in fact, I would encourage you to consider the great human enterprise of innovation and creativity and how directly dependent that creativity is on limitations. That's where human beings really light up. When we bump into limits, that's when we start getting inventive. So I'm not saying to fetishize your limits, but if a disability or an illness is coming and it's laying down a limit, don't despair. This is where we get really creative. This is where humans really shine if we let ourselves and if we encourage it, if we sort of honor that attitude. You don't have to accept that you're less than. No, you've got perspective. You can look at this situation in a different way. You don't have to buy that. Beautiful. Thank you, BJ. As always, Mm -hmm. I love talking to you. I always Mm -hmm. get my mind blown. Thank you, Shosh. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this conversation. It's a big one. It's a good one. So thank you for kicking it off. Thanks so much for listening today. This episode was produced by Transmitter Media and fact-checked by Ted. And special thanks to Anna Phelan, Sammy Case, Grace Rubenstein, Maria Lagis, and Colin Helms. I'm Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Stay well, and I'll talk to you next week.